So chapter 10 deals with the concept of moment of inertia. We'll spend the first learning module actually introducing the concept and looking at an example problem where we compute both directly by integration along with the help of a table lookup. So we've talked a lot about the design of beams. Beams are just load-bearing structures that are intended to span some distance as depicted here on the right from R to S. Typically, they're designed such that the loading is always perpendicular to their span. So uh, if we were to choose a design of this beam, what the design problem reduces to is actually just uh, considering, at least if we assume that it's homogeneous for now, the cross-sectional area of the beam. And when we think about the factors that uh, we would like in our beam, we want to minimize deflections, which are nothing more than how far this bends under load, because we can intuitively assume that that's related to the kind of induction of large stresses in the beam, which may lead to failure. So uh, one of the things that you may assume would influence how much the beam deflects is basically how heavy the beam is. And if you notice, uh, if under the assumption that the beam is made of a kind of homogeneous material across its span, we can relate the heaviness of the beam to basically how big the cross-sectional area is. So in each of these three cases, you can convince yourself that the cross-sectional area, easy to do in these two cases, you got to do a little computation here, is 30 centimeters squared. So if I were to construct a beam out of the same material for all three of those cross-sections, you might assume that each will have the same amount of deflection because they will all weigh the same. However, it turns out empirically that design A, the I-beam design, will actually experience the least amount of deflection. And the reason that that is, is because the majority of the area of this cross section is farthest separated from the actual loading access. So um, here it's clear to see the majority of the area is very close to the loading access. Here we've chosen the design that moves it farther away, but the I-beam is actually optimal for doing that uh, in maintaining a, surf a certain surface area along the span. So uh, why is that? Or how can we quantify it, I should say? We already said why it is. Well, we need a measure or a metric that basically um, computes how far area is away from an axis. So we already kind of talked about that with the centroid. If you remember when we computed the centroid of shapes, uh, it tended to be located under the, uh, I should say, I guess a better way to say it is, if you had a shape that had the majority of area away from the axis, that centroid would move away from the axis. So it's not surprising to us that the computation or metric we're going to use is going to look like a centroid, but in order to make it more sensitive to separation away from the axis, we're actually going to take that linear term, the X or the Y, and square it. And that's the moment of inertia. So moment of inertia is just a metric that we use to quantify how much area is separated from an axis, because it turns out, in this case, for computing the deflection of a beam, that that measure is, is meaningful. The areas which have large moment of inertia are going to experience minimal deflection. So here are the formulas. As we guess, they look a lot like a centroid computation. Only these linear terms, y and x, are now raised to the second power. Uh, because of that, uh, it's not surprising that this will take on units of length to the fourth power. Area, of course, is linked to the second power. y squared and x squared are linked to the second power. When you multiply them, you'll get linked to the fourth power. In addition to computing moments about the x and y axes, you can actually compute a polar moment as well. Uh, we're not going to go over that in uh, our lecture, but know that uh, it does exist and it kind of measures uh, the radial distance from the origin and it's related to the moment of inertia about each of the two axes. So not surprising that since these both look like centroid computations, that the process for making a computation is very similar to what we did for a centroid. Namely, uh, if we have a curve that's bound by some analytical function, we can use integration. So what if we wanted to find the moment of inertia of this shape, which was bounded on one side by a cubic function uh, using the approach that we just discussed? So as they're showing it here, they're dividing this into vertical rectangular areas. So we're going to be able to make our computation for the moment of inertia about the y-axis very easy because we know that if we have an area that we can compute uh, the area, in this case, the infinitesimal area is y times dx, as long as we can measure the distance from the axis to that area, we're going to be able to compute the moment of inertia. And uh, this is going to be something that's going to be easy to integrate because we just basically need to add up all the incremental contributions of the little areas. We can do that by allowing x to vary from zero to b, and uh, we'll be able to express y as a function of x using our formula. And that's exactly what's going on here. They're saying that to compute the moment of inertia about the y-axis, take the distance from the y-axis, which is just x for each of these little rectangles, square it, 
and multiply by the area of the little rectangles. Notice that dA is always just y dx as usual. Substitute y as a function of x, h uh, divided by b cubed, x cubed. Uh, put it all into your equation here, combine like terms. You get the constant h over b cubed, which can come out of the integral. Within the integral, we have x to the fifth dx. Use your uh, power rule for computing an antiderivative. Increase the power by one, x to the fifth becomes x to the sixth. Divide by six. Evaluate your upper bound minus your lower bound. Uh, since uh, this is proportional to x to the sixth, when we evaluate at zero, we'll just get zero. So what this becomes is just b plugged in for x, b to the sixth, b cubed, three factors of b will cancel. And I'm just left with one six b cubed times h. And that's an intuitive formula if we think about it, because um, naturally we would express, expect that this moment would be very sensitive to the value of b, because having a large b pushes the majority of the area away from the y-axis. So it's actually cubic in b, not too surprising. So unfortunately, if you think about how to use the same infinitesimal rectangular element in order to compute the moment about the x-axis, it's not going to be as easy. You just you kind of think of how that would be, and it's like, uh, it just seems a little bit tricky. And the trick that the book encourages you to use is the fact that you can actually look up a formula in order to compute the moment of each of these little infinitesimal areas about the x-axis. So what this is saying is if you have a rectangle and it's located on the x-axis and you want to compute its a moment of inertia, um, all that you need to do if you were to look this up in the table, it would probably uh, specify the height of the rectangle, which remember for any little rectangle will just be y times the width of the rectangle, which is dx. So the height cubed times dx times one third. So this is the formula they're getting in order to compute the moment of this little rectangle about the x-axis. So uh, by linearity, in order to compute the total uh, moment of inertia about the x-axis, you just have to integrate all of these. So uh, that's what they're doing here. They're saying that this uh, formula in the book says that if you have a rectangle on an axis, you can find its moment of inertia by taking one third, the height of the rectangle cube times the width. Uh, we know that the height y, which will be the height for any little rectangle, regardless of where you're at at next, can be expressed as a function of x using this function. So they're plugging that in. They're just doing a little algebra. Uh, when you cube h b cubed x cubed, you get h cubed over b to the ninth, x to the ninth. That's where that term is coming in. And we just need to sum all of these uh, contributions uh, for x. And that's all that we're doing here, right? We're just integrating uh, this expression. Uh, I don't know why they have uh, minus 2 to 0 here. Sorry about that. It should be from uh, 0 to b. I'll correct this before I actually uh, post the slides. But uh, if you if you do notice everything is the same here, that's just an error that they have in their integral bounds. I don't know where that is coming from, but uh, they did it correctly here. Just again, use your inverse power rule. When you take the antiderivative of x to the ninth, that's x to the 10 divided by 10. Evaluate, uh, don't have to worry about the zero term, just evaluate at x equals b. Do your cancellation and you find that uh, this is more sensitive to the h term which isn't surprising because having a larger value of h will separate more of the area from the x-axis. And that's what that moment of inertia about the x-axis is actually computing. So hopefully that made sense to you other than the book's typo on the bounds of integration, but I'll clean that up before you uh, actually see the slides posted.